Welcome everyone. Letting people into the webinar today, so please take your seats. Actually, I'm going to stretch for a second. I, you know, need to do some. <laughs> a bit too long. You start going a little bit. We all disappear. Oh, I'm here in my. I'll, I'll turn off my background real fast. You see, I'm here in my home, like many of you are, I expect. I wanted to welcome you all today to uh, the session on social geography and the built environment. We have three session, uh, three speakers, and um, each is gonna, you know, give their talk and then we'll open it up for some questions and crosstalk. Please add questions during their talks in the Q&A section. And uh, I'll just do a brief introduction to our first speaker. It's Karen Beardsley from UC Davis. And she's gonna be talking on teaching GIS, story maps and sustainable development goals. Karen, the floor is yours. Welcome. Great, thanks. Is my uh, screen properly shared? Yeah, I see it. All right, All right. We'll, go, we'll, we'll move on then. Great, thanks. It's great to be here today with everyone. Um, I, this, this is such a great idea to have the UCs come together for a GIS conference. So I really thank you to the organizers and all the people involved. Uh, so I'm gonna just give a brief history of GIS in California and at UC Davis. And this is because I'm an older person in that I've been involved in GIS in California since um, the, really the 1980s. So uh, it goes way back. So I really wanted to share some of the old timer talk. Then I wanna talk um, really fast forward about some of the teaching that I've done doing teaching a GIS class in um, a study abroad program in Bhutan, um, which is in a little map down there. It's, it's in the Himalaya mountains near Nepal. Um, so I was a Fulbright professor there for a year. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Then I'm gonna talk about the great virtual pivot of 2020 and the class that I sort of teach in Bhutan that I needed to shift, it and, shift and teach at uh, for UC Davis students this past summer. Then I wanna show you a little bit about the story maps and how I, um, as part of my job at Global Affairs, we're very involved in sustainable development goals. And so how I infused the sustainable development goals into the final projects for this GIS class that I taught this past summer, and then kind of wrap up with some of the challenges that are involved in that. Um, so first of all, just a little bit about who I am. Again, um, I, I've been doing GIS since 1989. Um, I got my, uh, I actually went to UC Davis for my ba bachelor's in applied mathematics. And um, so computer science emphasis and psychology minor. I then couldn't figure out what to do when I wanted to grow, when I grew up. So I joined the Peace Corps and was a, a, a science and math teacher in rural Kenya for two years. And after that, I decided I wanted to do something to do with, with wildlife conservation. So I ended up uh, getting a job at the United Nations Environment Program, um, mapping elephant populations for the continent of Africa, which then um, the results of that, which was a GIS analysis, even though when I was offered the position, I didn't know what GIS stood for. So I learned rather quickly what it was. I got a little bit of training. And uh, then next thing you know, I was working on this global, you know, or continental wide uh, issue. So I then came back and worked for the Bureau of Reclamation in uh, Sacramento for about a year. I uh, went to Santa, UC Santa Barbara and got a master's degree and uh, then have been working at UC Davis basically since 1993. So I worked in the environment, Department of Environmental Science and Policy and we started a research group called the Information Center for the Environment, which was one of the first places where we were kind of like a GIS service center or consulting center for not just the UC Davis campus, but also Sacramento uh, agencies being so, so close to Sacramento. Um, so we did a lot of, with biodiversity land use planning and those kinds of topics. Um, I took a year off and went and worked as a, a GIS analyst for the um, Wildlife Conservation Society in New York. Um, so then I got to do some really interesting international uh, work. And, um, and I also then just really decided that I wanted to get a PhD. So I joined the geography graduate group at UC Davis and uh, six years later got, got my PhD in geography. 
So fast forward a little bit, I was still working at ICE, uh, Information Center for the Environment, and I kind of um, had some projects going on and some knew some people in Bhutan and decided to apply for a Fulbright. So I, which I, by the way, encourage anyone to, uh, to apply for a Fulbright. It's, um, uh, it's not as horribly competitive as you might think, meaning, um, you know, you, everyone has a chance. And um, I'm really glad I applied because I was able to get a Fulbright to go and teach GIS for a year at the Royal Timpu College in Bhutan. Um, after that, I decided to sort of try to take the GIS, uh, the lab that we that I had set up there, and the and the place that I'd come to know so well, and the people that I knew, and then started a study abroad program that I'll talk about in, a little bit more in, in a moment. And again, since uh, since I returned from my Fulbright, I've um, changed jobs a bit, and now I'm directing global professional programs in global affairs at UC Davis. So a little bit of a, a career move there, but I'm still doing GIS. So let me just back up and share some of my uh, knowledge from way back when. Uh, basically, in you know before 1990, when I learned GIS, there was no internet. Uh, we used mainframe computers. I I learned on Arc Info version 4.2. Um, and if you wanted GIS data, you had to find a map. You had to digitize it, and there was no such thing as metadata. So. But there was in California in the early 90s something called the Teal Data Center. Um, I doubt many of you remember it, but uh, this was where they maintained a data library. They, it was a cost recovery kind of program. They kept everything in this ARC info coverage format. Uh, they uh, charged a subscription fee and they, again, stored all these different kinds of data. Well, this was problematic for a, a UC, when I moved, came to UC Davis in um, the 1993, we wanted data, we would have had to pay a lot of money for it, and we didn't have that kind of money. So one of the things um, that I, I did was help negotiate the first licensing agreement for Teal data free of charge. And this then um, expanded and other UC campuses were able to benefit from that, which was great. Um, but you know, nowadays, fast forward, there's ArcGIS Online, there's thousands and thousands of layers, things are shared. So really things have changed so dramatically um, in, in a good way since, since those early days. But I just wanted to share some of that background. Um, one of the things that I was involved in early on in 1996 is creating the, probably one of the first internet mapping solutions um, around. And it was, it was using um, a whole series. It was basically written in, um, I can't remember the name of that, uh, AML, I think ARC macro, macro language uh, programming, and then a programmer sort of uh, uh, did all the Perl programming in the background. Anyway, but we let users decide what they wanted to have mapped, and we produce a map and send it back to them in 1996. So that was kind of one of the cool first GIS uh, things that we did before there was a, a, an ARC map or ArcGIS online. So fast forward, I, I um, was able to uh, go live in Bhutan. I took my husband and my, our then 11 year old daughter and uh, also our two dogs, but that's another story. And um, basically uh, set up a GIS lab. It was one of the first, um, certainly one of the first GIS programs in this country. And uh, it was a fabulous, fabulous experience. Um, in fact, and this is just the, uh, the link here is, is uh, listed for the page where uh, the, the, GI, the um, study abroad program that I, I teach the GIS class now in the same campus where I was the Fulbright professor. So I've taken about 20 to 24 students um, in 2018 and 2019. And of course, all set to go in 2020. And um, this global pandemic came along. So basically, um, well, let me show you that in a minute. But, but what, what the, the study abroad class that I did in 2019 um, I had the students uh, put together story maps. So this is when the, uh, the newer version, the ArcGIS story maps um, had just come out. And the students were supposed to, they did projects. Um, it was a very project-based course. They did projects on gross national happiness, which is Bhutan's sort of uh, alternative to gross national product. And the students um, got into groups and they put together projects and they tied those projects to gross national happiness. And so I'm hoping, I know I'm a little short of time, so I'm not going to go through and show this um, entire story map right now, but it's, um, I'll give a, a, a really quick glimpse into it in that it's, uh, it's basically a story maps of story maps. So it, it, it starts talking about the class, there's a picture of all the class dressed in traditional Bhutanese clothing, and then the student projects, and then each of the students projects are, are listed. So, you know, if you wanted to then, um, you know, look at the project, you could click on that particular button 
and it's of course going to bring you to uh, to that the, the story map that the students put together and they incorporated all sorts of things all sorts of data they had to make interactive maps and, okay. and so um, so yes. it looks like we're just seeing your desktop right now oh no okay sorry about that no problem uh, now are we back to seeing the slides yeah okay well there's the link <laughs> So feel free to, uh, to uh, maybe someone can put that in the chat. Um, anyway, uh, so anyway, the, then this great pivot had to happen uh, in summer session one uh, for this uh, GIS class at UC Davis. So it's an upper division class, introduction to GIS. And I know probably all the UCs have a similar kind of course. And it's a combination of GIS practice and theory. And I had about 40 to 45 students take the class. Um, and it was 100% remote learning using Canvas and Zoom. I know this sounds very routine now because we're all doing this, um, but the first time one has to teach in this, in this atmosphere is, is rather challenging. I think with ArcGIS software, we, um, we had some students, about a third of them were able to load it on their own computers and the rest had to remote desktop to a lab. There were, of course, a lot of issues with that, um, but we got through most of it. Um, they, uh, they learned in ArcGIS Pro uh, we had lab exercises uh, that, that some colleagues and I had developed for the Society for Conservation GIS that we were able to use. So it was very natural resource management based. Uh, we had them do a couple of ArcGIS online exercises and one story map exercise. And then um, they moved into, um, into their projects. So I did have the experience of giving a midterm exam in Zoom and having my internet fail in the middle of it. So, I then um, sort of decided before having a final exam. I, I, so you guys are still seeing the slides now again, right? Just to, just a thumbs up. Okay. Well, we're seeing your website. A uh, website. I'm not sure it's the slides. Oh, oh, you're seeing this. Are you over here? We're seeing something that says V towns. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yeah, have great. you been seeing that the whole time? Not the whole we're time. But... Your... No, sorry. Let's go. All right, hang on. I'm gonna try something here. Go ahead, Susan. Sorry to interrupt. Oh no. Um, yeah, we were saying letting me know. Oh, this is it's one of those things like I don't know what everybody's what's being shown. So I'm going to okay, let's try this one more time to make sure I'm showing the right thing. I'm just going on and on and on. Okay, now are you seeing the grading scheme? Yeah, now we're seeing slides. Okay. I guess once I switched over and tried to show you the, um, anyway, all right. So uh, so basically I, I had to kind of do an interesting change in that instead of having it focused on a final exam after the midterm was such a disaster, um, switch to changing the grading scheme. So final projects became a very huge part of the grade. And so, and this also then included this sustainable development goals being a big part of, of the projects. Uh, and here's the grading uh, breakdown and so on, but I, I'm not gonna get into all that in the interest of time. Um, what I do wanna, you, now are you seeing the slide that's about the sustainable development goals? Okay, again, just checking. So um, one of my colleagues, jo Jolynn Shoemaker from Global Affairs um, came into the, to the meeting and, and shared with the students the aspects behind the sustainable development goals, which is this sort of UN uh, based uh, agenda uh, through uh, 2030 to, uh, and there's 17 of these sustainable development goals. I suspect many of you are familiar with them. UC Davis has sort of a plan for, for working on integrating these goals into many of the things that we do. Uh, we have sort of a, a strategy moving onward about how to engage people in the goals. And one of the things is, of course, in, incorporating it into um, the learning activities of students. We did a faculty um, workshop, and basically these are the sustainable development goals that our faculty seem to be most engaged with. And then I'm going to just go to, to where my students did final projects on the sustainable development goals. And again, you know, the main ones were goal three, which is good health and well-being, goal 10, uh, which is re reduced inequalities, and then the climate change and life on land are kind of the ones that stood out. I did, um, I did use a rubric for grading a story map, just given that, um, you know, students were learning a story map for the first time and they needed to know how they were being graded on it. And I found this, uh, I adopted my rubric from one that I found online. 
And um, so that, again, it was pretty clear how to get full credit would be to, you know, have things working in such a way and how the partial credit uh, was, was um, included. So the biggest challenges were, of course, lecturing uh, to Zoom boxes, technical glitches with the remote desktop, inadequate testing environment, as I mentioned, giving a midterm on Zoom. I think also uh, it's important to let students choose whether group or individual projects are best for them. So I really found out the hard way when I told students they all had to be in a group, many of them just wanted to work alone. It was very hard to work in a group of people that didn't know and could never meet other than in a Zoom environment. So we were very flexible with that. My groups were one to four people. Editing story maps within a group, you can set it up at the very beginning. So more than one person can edit the story map, but you have to do that at the start. So just uh, something I learned along the way. I think moving data between ArcGIS Pro and ArcGIS Online was, was definitely a challenge. Um, there are a lot of restrictions in using uh, online data in Pro and what you can do with it and so on. Um, and also just letting having students understand the sharing permissions and how everything, if you wanna share with everyone, Every single file that you access has to be shared with everyone and, and just making sure that's clear. So that was definitely a challenge. Um, what I did want to do was I wanted to show the final projects page. Just um, again, I'm seeing kind of I have a couple minutes left. So um, I'm going to try once again. Now, can you see my screen that says UC Davis summer class? OK, so you can see that I'm going to make that full screen. Still see it? Okay, so this is a collection. So this new um, they ha uh, story maps has you the ability to put story maps in a collection. So this is a collection of the 21 story maps that my students did in um, the various groups. And you know, again, I I, I can't go through all of these, but I, they they did quite an amazing um, job. And I'll just click on the first one. Um, uh, actually, in some of my one group of my students are going to submit to the uh, the Esri Story Map competition for sustainable development goals that is open right now. Um, so this this group did um, sustainable cities. So they they um, you know they talked about various aspects of sustainable cities. They tied it um, to the sustainable development goal, which I think was right at the beginning. Yeah, the eleventh goal: sustainable cities and communities. It's going to be a little slow bringing things up. But they, you know, they used the swipe tool. They brought in layers. They, uh, you know, they had some static maps. They had some um, interactive maps. And again, it's just not loading very quickly. But um, you know, uh, in in the end, they sort of end up with a final map, ideal locations for green building design in San Francisco, based on the data they brought together. And you know, they did just just an amazing uh, a job of this. So um, this is actually a static map, but they have interactive maps in here as well. Um, so then sort of they all kind of, um, you know, put in their citations at the end. And uh, so it's, it's a great experience for, because, you know, I think as an instructor, one of the things that I always tell people is, you know, as it, this is about communication. It's not just about, uh, about um, maps and data, it's about communicating information. So that was really key to, to what I was, um, I was doing here. Um, so I think, if I try to move this, um, yay, just one sec, we're almost done. Okay. Uh, are we back to the slides or not? Yeah, we're on slides now. I got it to work that time. All right. So I talked about the challenges. I just want to sort of end on um, a quote by Jack Dangerman, uh, which has always really stuck with me. The application of GIS is limited only by the imagination of those who use it. So. Um, with that, thank you for listening. And I hope I didn't go too much over my time. And if you have any questions about this, uh, we'll, I hope to have some time at the end. So thank you. Thank you. We had some uh, folks, and me included, was asking for um, if you can share some of the links to the story maps in the chat. So we can... I'll do that. I'll do that now as we're, as we're talking. So I'll, I'll make sure I put those there. Thanks. All right. Again, I'm gonna take a quick stretch. These are longer, these are not lightning talks. So quick stretch before uh, um, our next talk. All right, I feel ready to go. We're going to have the next talk is, is titled Fieldwork from Afar, oh, Using Story Maps for Site Visits. And I'd like to welcome Rain Laborde, who's uh, at UCLA. And um, 
The floor is yours. Uh, is Casey going to be with you or is it just uh, you presenting yes. today? Yeah, Cassie is presenting with me. Okay. Um, so hi, everyone. Oh, there she is. I'm sorry, you were off screen. It's, you know, me again, learning how to use these remote tools is just like, <laughs> I apologize. Welcome, Cassie. Great. Um, do you see a green slide? I do. It looks really um, good on my screen. I'll Wonderful. I'll be quiet now, and I'm looking forward to listening to your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Rain Laborde, and today Cassie Hoprich and I are here on behalf of City Lab UCLA to share how, for our team, Story Maps has really become an essential tool for remote field work in the time of COVID. Uh, so, City Lab is housed within UCLA's Department of Architecture and Urban Design. We were founded in 2006 and we're concerned with the spatial justice of contemporary urban issues, urban design, and the architecture of the city. City Lab shares space and staff and even parts of our methodology with CoLab, an off-campus engaged research collaborative in Westlake, Los Angeles, which is uh, what the research we're sharing today falls under, as well as the Urban Humanities Initiative, an interdisciplinary graduate program which integrates the interpretive historical approaches of the humanities with the material projective practices of design to document, elucidate, and transform the cultural object we call the city. Um, so all of our collective work is centered on spatial justice and collaboration. And on that note, we really hope to hear from some of you after today's presentation. We're always looking for new collaborators and new projects. Last spring, one of CoLab's Westlake partners, a school group known as Grupo Nuevo, reached out with a question. How should they rethink student pedestrian safety outside the walls of their campus? Uh, of their student body, nearly half used public transit or walked to school, and of students who stayed for after school programs, almost all walked or took transit home. Uh, this grew into what we refer to as the Grupo Nuevo Partnership. The school initially approached us with concerns predominantly centered on their broad northern neighbor, the 10 lane 101 freeway. Uh, so because of that freeway, cars are speeding through the area to get on. Um, but it also provides one of the few permanent and deep sources of public shade and shelter in Los Angeles, which combined with our city's housing crisis has resulted in extensive unhoused encampments along the same underpass areas where students are commuting. Um, so the school reported that students would walk in busy streets to avoid the tents and that some, some young women in particular were even bringing weapons to school because they felt so vulnerable in these spaces. Simultaneously, the school recognized and was receptive to one of our early goals of the project, focusing on investment and opportunity, not displacement. So we understood that moving or policing these encampments would not produce the kinds of equitable community change the school was really talking about when they were talking about having students feel safe. Uh, it quickly became clear to us that what they needed wasn't simply uh, a pedestrian plan, but instead a community engagement plan for the school to better connect with neighbors. And that includes unhoused neighbors, as well as business owners who had the power to impact public spaces. Um, so we started with really all of these spatial observations of conflict, negotiation, contested boundaries, and often contested jurisdictions in terms of city, county, and state, as well as private land. Uh, and normally at this phase in one of our projects, we would come together with students, educators, unhoused neighbors, and other community stakeholders to collectively think through these issues, the strengths of the area, people's memories, hopes, and complications. Uh, and we normally do this through drawings, stories, diagrams, photographs, and more within the space of what we refer to as a thick map, a critical cartography practice that centers storytelling and really honors the complexity and competing narratives of space here. Crucially, thick mapping creates room for the introduction of different spatial orientations rather than a top-down plan view and goes further than charting data. In the words of Todd Presner, David Shepard, and Yo Kuano, who uh, I believe is here with us today, so hi Yo. Uh, thick mapping comprises the processes of collecting, aggregating, and visualizing ever more layers of geographic or place-specific data to embody temporal and historic dynamics through a multiplicity of layered narratives, sources, and even representational practices. So thick mapping is crucial to how we as an organization understand space, both through urban humanities, CoLab, and City Lab. 
Uh, and to date, each of our projects has really started with quite literally bringing everyone to the table around the map. Yet under strict stay at home orders and school closures, our ability to collaborate in this way was lost. Uh, so we couldn't even conduct traditional methods of quantitative data science like pedestrian counts or walk audits with students because their school was closed. Um, and we also realized in conversations that even after just a few months away, people were really struggling to think back and speak to specific spaces and conditions. So as we pulled together all of our notes and the school's concerns, rather than asking how to replicate the thick mapping process online, we asked how considering a new way to use and interact with thick maps could actually become a framework for site visits from afar. So a way for us to explore both established and emerging concerns with community members who had varying levels of familiarity with and diverse opinions on this area. Uh, furthermore, we really sought to create a kind of feedback loop between showing and mapping. Between every interview, every virtual site visit, or every group meeting, the map could be updated, building up the story of this area. This was particularly important because we had a hunch from prior work in the neighborhood that these concerns on behalf of the school were really part of a broader Westlake issue. Decades of disinvestment and heavy policing in this Latinx community, which was known as a site of gang activity in the 80s and 90s, had resulted in this complete lack of investment in public space. Part of being able to imagine how students and by extension the whole community could feel safe, empowered, and welcome necessitated being able to collectively identify sites where fences, boulders, and expanses of empty paving were replacing what may have otherwise been benches, restrooms, shade structures, really armatures for lingering and socializing. And I'll hand it over to Cassie. Thanks, Rain. So that's what brought us to Story Maps as a platform. Um, this tool allowed us to dynamically interpret qualitative data and supplement the lack of quantitative data that we weren't able to collect due to the pandemic. Um, most importantly, it allowed us to digest and spatially orient any and all information that we gathered. Uh, it really presented a number of features for us to use in our effort to bridge the pandemic induced digital divide that was imposed on all of us involved in the project. So as you can see, the story map platform allowed us to first and foremost utilize a map. Upon this map, we were able to use the GIS tools to identify some of the observations that Rain has made note of, such as the multiple jurisdictions in the area, as indicated by drawn boundaries, uh, boundaries that highlight the land owned by Grupo Nuevo, and also utilize pins to demarcate key nodes of activity or opportunity, such as the paths of travel for the students and school faculty, the challenging dynamics along the perimeter of the soccer field, a place inaccessible to much of the community and so on. So employing a thick map approach encouraged us to make this dynamic map, one that would become an essential tool for reworking our understanding of the area. The platform and its features also encouraged us to consider how certain facets of the neighborhood experience could be represented outside of a plan view map or a traditional map. So working with Grupo Nuevo remotely, mostly over Zoom, and having limited capacity for site visits, it became clear that we needed uh, story maps to help us bridge the digital divide I just mentioned. This tool helped us create, or recreate rather, a site visit and bring people back into the space. We utilize multimedia to again, digest and spatially orient information in a multitude of ways. For instance, we sought to better understand the experience of walking through the neighborhood. Of course, numerous site visits would have typically been the method by which we would have gotten that insight. Yet students weren't there to observe, and there was a lack of quantitative data to help us understand the volume of students in the area at any particular time of day. By using both the plan view map and its editing functionality, Google map images, and most importantly, video and photos collected by us on site, we could recreate a walkthrough of the area. Using story maps, we were able to conduct this walkthrough over and over again with a number of stakeholders in order to piece together an understanding of what a typical school day might look like. So taking a step back, what's so important about collecting and spatially orienting information for a project like this, is it allows us as the researchers to build consensus amongst stakeholders in a way that is both experiential and accessible. Uh, story maps really helped us to play out neighborhood dynamics, understand the complexities of certain sites, and make note of underutilized areas that we could talk through potential ideas and interventions with stakeholders about. This process helped create a situating framework, or frameworks that were foundational in our work to conceive of urban design and other programmatic interventions for the school, its students, and the neighborhood at large. 
I also want to recognize and note that uh, we're in a position of power creating this map, this experiential map to use throughout this process. And so it was really important for us to consider what dynamics we chose to present in the map, what language we use to articulate the certain uses of space and what information to maybe not include. Uh, the combination of a dynamic map and multimedia materials encouraged us to be considerate of how we present and humanize all members of this community. Uh, for example, we didn't employ language that indicated undesirable people or dynamics and instead focused on opportunities for connection. So building on this point, it's important for us to note that we were not uh, able to organically engage with people in the neighborhood. As such, interviews were integral to the project. The Story Maps platform was our tool and guide for the interviews that we conducted. Some interviews were safely conducted in person, others were bound to the Zoom world. Uh, but Story Maps became the archive envisioning platform for documenting their feedback. Spatially situating this feedback in Story Maps helped us to breathe life into our own evolving understanding of a neighborhood that had, of course, dramatically shifted throughout the pandemic. So next slide, please. So uh, though this talk is more about the process, we wanna give you a quick peek at the end product. Uh, the thick mapping and interview process led to a framework for future interventions. Hoover Juntos is the name of these interventions, a name inspired by the street Hoover and the Spanish word for together or joined together for a common purpose, Juntos. It identifies key areas or microecologies, if you will, that are ripe for a flooding of communal values, resources, and activity. Uh, we recommended urban design interventions that build off of the community feedback we gathered, uh, as well as some programmatic interventions that stand to change out security teams and policing methodologies with sidewalk stewards, whose work could establish positive relationships with both students and encampment residents. Next slide, please. Uh, so true to form, we end outside of the map with one of the proposed interventions we shared with Grupo Nuevo. In this rendering, you can see our reimagination of a soccer field. Our thick mapping process and interview process revealed an enormous amount of tension surrounding the space. Uh, it's a central public space, space within the area that we were focused on. Uh, so we have proposed that this site be opened up to the community to allow for greater use and access to the space, bridging fractured sections of the neighborhood by offering use of the restrooms, uh, the field as a place for services for unhoused neighbors, and even movie nights that can be enjoyed by everyone. Uh, you're welcome to view the full report in its entirety. Um, we will send out a link to the final report. So with that, uh, if you would like to know more about us, you can find us at the UCLA City Lab website. Uh, I believe Dana Cuff, our director, posted it uh, and another link in the chat. You can also explore more of the theory of thick mapping through the Hypercities and Urban Humanities publications here. And if you're a UCLA grad student or considering UCLA, we hope that you'll join us in the Urban Humanities program, which we are both alum of. Thanks all. Casey and Rain. Wow. Um, thank you so much. This pandemic produced digital divide is something that I'm trying to digest. Um, and while I do that, um, I'd like to invite Emily Esposito to share their talk. It's on gay migration versus person environment and attitudinal fit, a regional analysis. Emily, the floor is yours. All right, great. Thank you so much. Um, let me just pull up my slides real quick. Yes. All right. Okay, great. Um, well, hi everyone. Thank you all for being here. I hope you don't mind if I switch gears a little bit and go into some psychology and research. Um, like uh, Scott said, I will be talking about gay migration and person environment th fit through a regional analysis. So overwhelmingly, people like to fit their environments. People uh, want to live around others who are similar to them whether that's based on political ideology or personality, 
all these things have kind of been shown that people like to be around those like them. Uh, for example, those who live in the South um, can be quite high in agreeableness, leading to this culture of Southern hospitality. And so those who live in the South that maybe aren't very agreeable, either they get more agreeable or maybe they just get out of there and head to New York City that's a bit more or a bit less agreeable and they can be surrounded by those who are like them. Um, and this is kind of this idea of selective migration where people will go to places that fit them or and leave places that don't fit them. So this kind of migration has been discussed before with some other groups such as lesbian and gay individuals. So there is this concept of gay migration where gay people have a tendency to move to more open places, typically big cities, to find their community and to feel accepted there. Um, this is a very common theme in a lot of works, for example, in works of fiction, such as musicals or books. Um, I think this line from the musical The Prom really outlines this well, where the lead character, a lesbian high school student, talks about how she wants to get out of Indiana and go to somewhere more accepting like San Francisco, and she's just hoping that the bus will be able to take her there. This also comes up in works of nonfiction, uh, such as books and even some papers. And despite this theme being so common, there's just not a lot of like quantitative empirical research that has been done to examine how people migrate based on their sexual orientation or at least until my study. So the present study is looking, is taking an empirical look at both how sexual orientation affects people's migration, as well as how their attitudes towards gay and straight people, you know, which one do they prefer, that may also affect their migration. So based on the previous research in other areas, as well as um, the anecdotal evidence that I've kind of discussed, um, we had a couple of ideas about where this research would go. So for the first hypothesis, uh, I call this the person environment fit hypothesis. And this is just the idea that regardless of sexual orientation, people want to be around those who fit them. So if they are someone who has a very strong preference for straight people over gay people, and perhaps they're not too fond of gay people, they might want to live around others who agree with them. On the other hand, if people have a high view of um, gay and lesbian individuals, they might want to live around those who agree with them. And then um, hypothesis two goes into this kind of gay migration idea, which is that same sex attracted people or lesbian, gay and bisexual individuals, they will have even more of a motivation to go to a gay friendly area and uh, also away from a gay unfriendly area, even on top of this person environment fit that I'm discussing. So these hypotheses kind of guide my following study. And in this study, I used a lot of um, big data sources uh, with already collected um, data. So at the person level, what we looked at was uh, Project Implicit Sexuality Data. This is a website that um, you can all access and do an implicit sexuality test on, but they also measure a ton of other things. So they measure your implicit sexuality attitudes. These are kind of your like quick gut feelings towards different groups. Maybe they're a little more hidden than other attitudes you may have, as well as your explicit sexuality attitudes. These are more thought out, more considered, um, probably measured by just checking off how you feel about people, things like that. And then they also collect uh, data about the people that participate in their um, research, and that is they collect their sexual orientation as well as their current and longest lived postal codes. This is important because using the postal codes, I was able to not only determine if people migrated, as well as where they came from and where they went to. Um, and then to better understand where they're moving to and from, I use data from Public Religion Research Institute to find kind of this regional gay friendliness. This organization, uh, does nationally representative surveys. And I used four of their surveys to look at these three questions about uh, gay friendliness that ask about anti-discrimination laws against um, LGBT people, um, allowing small businesses to refuse services to gay and lesbian people, as well as how they feel about uh, allowing gay and lesbian couples to marry legally. So I kind of aggregated these values into designated market areas or DMAs to create this um, map of 
regional gay friendliness, it goes on a scale of one to four, with four being the most gay friendly. Um, we also picked designated market areas because they cover the whole country and they are broken down by which media different regions get. And if a region is getting all of the same media, there is reason to believe that they may have things like attitudes in common. So moving on with this uh, data set, we had quite a number of participants across many years. And here are just some variables uh, to kind of break down some of what we found. Overall, regions tended to be more gay friendly than um, not gay friendly, I guess, uh, with all these places averaging above their scales midpoint. Um, but on the other hand, sexuality attitudes, uh, both implicit and explicit, tended to be um, more pro-straight than pro-gay, which I suppose makes sense. And um, then our participants, while most of them were heterosexual, we did have a decent number of homosexual and bisexual participants, about 10% um, each. And then there's also 3% that fell into this other category, which kind of encompasses multiple orientations, such as people identify as queer, questioning, or just self-reported other on the survey. So now with these participants, I examined uh, migration first. So to see if people migrated based on their characteristics and the regional gay friendliness of where they were from. So um, the two interactions that I listed here are important because they map onto these hypotheses that I've presented. So first we look at how personal sexuality attitude and regional gay friendliness work together to predict migration. Um, this can either show a person environment fit uh, where people have the same ideology as the region that they are from, or there could be a misfit in which case we think that that will predict uh, migration. Then we also look at this other interaction here that examines uh, sexual orientation on top of person environment fit. So this is seeing how LGB people migrate compared to straight people, how those who are same sex attracted may migrate differently. Um, so first we're gonna be looking at the effects of sexual orientation and explicit attitudes on migration. So, um, this graph has on the y-axis the probability or likelihood of migrating, um, while the, sorry, the y-axis, I think I said that right, and then the x-axis on the bottom there has um, explicit straight over gay preference. So as you go from the left to right, you get increasingly pro-straight preference. Um, as you can see here, oh, sorry, and then each of these three lines right here, um, we have different levels of gay friendliness. So for the uh, heterosexual participants who are pictured here, we found that they had a very strong fit mechanism. So at low gay friendliness, which is this red orange line at the top there, as when they're in a gay unfriendly place, as they become more biased, more pro-straight, they are less likely to migrate. So that shows some sort of fit that when they are uh, have a very pro-straight bias, they are less likely to leave a gay unfriendly place. On the bottom there, we see this gay friendly line, that blue line that shows the reverse, that as people in gay friendly places become more biased against gay people, they are more likely to migrate. So this shows fit for the heterosexual participants. However, for our other sexual orientations, this fit mechanism was not really what was happening. Instead, what we had was that people who are same-sex attracted in a gay unfriendly place are more likely to move than those who are in a gay friendly place. And you can kind of see that because these orange red lines are at the top and uh, these slopes are all um, non-zero essentially. So they do not change as uh, uh, attitudes change. Uh, this is also you know, true for the heterosexuals that um, they are more likely to migrate from gay unfriendly places. However, uh, for uh, the homosexual, bisexual, and other participants, this was regardless of their own attitudes, while attitude mattered for heterosexual participants. Um, for our implicit attitudes, which are, you know, our more gut reactions, there is a different story here. So this happened across all sexual orientations. There was no difference based on sexual orientation. And what we found was that at high regional gay friendliness, this blue line right there, as implicit sexuality attitude increased and became more pro-straight, 
people are more likely to migrate. Uh, this makes sense since at high anti-gay bias and high gay friendliness, there is a person environment misfit. And um, like I said, people like to fit their environment. And this happens across sexual orientations and this is the main area where the effect is shown. So now we know that people are migrating away from, so the question becomes, where are they going? So in this first study, or so in this part two here, we looked at how attitude and sexual orientation affect where people move to, as well as how these work together to predict where people migrate, both their attitudes and their sexual orientation. So to break this down, we first have this graph right here that has on the y-axis an increasing regional gay friendliness. Um, as you go bottom up, it becomes more gay friendly. Um, and then across our x-axis, we have the same thing as before. We have attitudes, this time explicit attitudes. Um, but what we found here is that um, the straight participants had a very strong negative slope, meaning that as they became more pro-straight, they ended up in regions that were lower in gay friendliness. This very much shows our fit mechanism that as they become more biased, they are going to a place that kind of shares that bias. However, for our homosexual, bisexual, and other participants, we didn't see such mechanism. Um, all of these non-straight groups are kind of middling. They're not changing much based on their personal attitudes and this kind of goes against both fit mechanisms and gay migration theories. Um, so I'm not quite sure why that happens, but I'd love to hear opinions if anyone has them. And I'll continue researching this in uh, my career. So then we move on to implicit sexuality attitudes. And here it seems like everyone is just migrating based on fit, where again, we have these negative slopes with as people increase in their anti-gay bias, they are going to places with lower regional gay friendliness. This happens across sexual orientations, and this kind of goes with what we found in the first part of this study where implicit attitudes predict a person environment fit across sexual orientations. So to kind of sum all that up, because it's a bunch of graphs and a big mouthful, um, I'll say that there are a couple of big differences that were shown. So first of all, sexual orientation matters in this migration pattern. So straight people migrate based on fit. They just go wherever their attitudes are gonna be matched by the people. Uh, while on the other hand, gay and lesbian people migrate based on where they're coming from, kind of in accordance to these um, gay migration theories. They just are trying to leave gay unfriendly places. They're more likely to stay in gay friendly places. But then we also see these differences based on attitudes where these explicit attitudes are more thought out, um, considered attitudes predict migration only in heterosexual participants. Well, while these implicit attitudes, the more hidden gut feeling type attitudes uh, have an equal effect across um, sexual orientations. Um, and while I feel like this was uh, had some really good outcomes and everything, there are some problems with the data and a little bit of lingering questions. Um, we used project implicit data and people can just go on that website and do it. So it is a self-selected sample. It's not representative really. Um, so there could be some issues with that. We also had a very high proportion of people migrating. It seemed that 98% of our sample migrated, which is quite high considering um, other data sets that have been collected or other research that's been done with this data set, as well as um, just census estimates of how many people move per year. And then this was also an observational study, so it can't predict a causation. Um, if any of you have taken an intro psych class, you know all about correlation and causation. And finally, we found that gay migration predicts where they are coming from, but it does not predict where they're going for gay people. So there is something kind of weird there where they are moving away from gay and friendly places, but not going anywhere particularly gay friendly. Um, so with all of that in mind, there are some exciting future directions that I've listed here. The one that I'll highlight is that we have started looking at this experimentally. So trying to give participants um, pictures of different places and seeing if they would like to migrate there. And then looking at how their orientation, their attitudes, and the type of stimuli we show them affects their desire to migrate.
And so hopefully by doing this experimentally, we can get at some of these questions that are a little puzzling as well as handle some of these other concerns that I raised. So um, with all of that, I would like to thank you all for listening. Um, thank you to everyone who made GIS Week happen. Uh, I'm very happy to be a part of it. And of course, thank you to my PI, Dr. Jimmy Calanchini and everyone at the RSSC lab that helped me, gave me feedback on this, tried to make me not um, talk too much about statistics in it. So uh, thanks and I uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you. Please don't forget to put any questions to our speakers in the Q&A feed. I wanted to kind of cycle back a little bit overall. What, what I'm sort of hearing is this challenge of connection, and especially in these digital space. And I'm curious, you know, Karen, what your faculty colleagues are responding to the challenges of remote teaching. And then Rainey and, and Casey kind of, you know, how do you facilitate conversations in this digital space that is equitable and, and inclusive um, with, while well, people are dealing with different internet connections or literacy in the digital space and, um, well, I'll hold off there. It's a very fascinating challenge we're facing in this remote environment. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'll just comment that, you know, I, I went from a 24-7 interaction with students when we're on a study abroad program to basically a zero uh, interaction uh, other than this, you know, Zoom. And I found that particularly challenging because I didn't get to know my students. I mean, uh, and I think other faculty that I've talked to are, are experiencing a very similar thing and just trying to identify ways to keep the engagement level high, to keep, to be able to get to know your students, even in the frame. Because honestly, I mean, I have students asking me for letters of recommendation, for example. And if I have had a student that I've met in this environment, I don't feel I know them well enough, even, you know, uh, whereas the students that I get to really interact with, with or, you know, which, which of course study abroad is kind of a, it's the other extreme, but I will say that um, the hardest, I think the hardest part is, yeah, just keeping keeping students engaged and then dealing with techn technology. I mean, it's one thing to teach uh, maybe a, a less technical focused course uh, and then something that requires pretty high end software and students need to have access and you spend, you spend half your time just dealing with the access issues and no learning really goes, very little learning goes on. So. I think I think the challenges are still ongoing and and you know we just are I think it's important for all of us to share our successes uh, as as we learn in this environment. Yeah, I, I absolutely echo that. Um, and I think one of the things that's been really noticeable for us is we've uh, moved a bit away from focus groups um, and gone more with individual interviews. Um, which is very different than the way that we normally interact with uh, constituents and um, experts on site uh, for that exact same reason, um, right? It's really difficult to sidebar in any kind of Zoom setting. So whether we're doing urban design workshops with middle schoolers or we've been doing a lot of projects with older adults, um, you know, you, you get kind of stuck where if someone's struggling, you're just going to expect that you're not going to hear from them during class and you'll just have to make that up later. Um, so in our case, during workshops. Uh, so more individual work uh, has ironically been what's helped us build community during this time. Yeah, actually, just to add to that, uh, we had to make a lot of decisions in terms of how to allocate our resources and time because of the reality of the pandemic. And so for us, it really forced us to figure out, you know, where is a digital intervention not going to cut it? Um, the story map really helped us with folks that did have access to a computer and did have the time to speak with us. Mm -hmm. But there was no way we could make up for in-person interviews with the unhoused residents that lived right next to the school. Folks that the, that the you know, school hadn't even really engaged with, despite them having lived there for eight years. 
And so uh, it minimized the number of in-person interactions that we had to have as researchers, but it also told us what was important. And so we did go out with masks and, and uh, gift cards for those that we interviewed to compensate them and conducted those interviews. But I think that that's something that Rain and I talked a lot about um, with our project and others is that you have to uh, not fully rely on the digital platform, but it can definitely step in um, to supplement what we're missing out on uh, during this time. Like using tools as supplementals and not being dependent on it. And it leads me to a question for Emily. NJ mentions that they work often with case studies and ethnographic research. And I had read an excellent book by queer authors who chose to fight for LGBTQ rights in, I think, South Carolina, that has a few stories by folks who moved away from the South and came back. And they're curious to ask if oral history of long form histories will be done as part of your work. That kind of echoes Casey's doing individual conversations that has an oral history component to it to bring to other tools like statistical analysis. Yeah, um, I saw that question and thank you for your uh, compliment as well. I saw you had sent in to MJ. And um, personally, I think I'm going to be sticking more to the statistics mathematical side of things. I. Um, I'm just a little bit more of a math nerd than I am a history ethnographer type person, but um, I definitely think that there is a place for both of those things in this research. Like I said, there are plenty of examples of more of this um, like historical or nonfiction type writing about groups migrating. And I think that provides a great basis for me to jump off of and say, oh, this is backed by numbers too, which I think always just gives an extra fun little element to uh, things. But um, yeah, I will say though, because I think these two work so, so well together, um, I'd love to talk offline if you'd ever, um, maybe I can just drop my email in the chat if anyone here wants to. Um, I feel like a lot of LGBTQ plus research um, it, ha it happens in psychology, but it's not as common as some other minority groups in terms of the research done with them. So I love getting outside perspectives from cultural or from cultural people and all of that. So I'd love to hear um, your thoughts and maybe check out that book because that sounds very interesting. So thank you. Thank you. I wanna also mention we do have a Slack. It's another tool, but uh, another tool to hopefully connect with people. Um, Parker Welsh had a question for Casey and Rainey. Do you, did you get any feedback from the more non-technical users? I suspect one of the main values of story maps is bridging that gap. Can you speak to any changes in audience understanding from a planning perspective, specifically from leadership who may not be in the weeds of a typical project? Yeah, I'm just reading the question again. Um, yeah, well, I think something that Rain and I talked about a lot was for all projects that are very dependent, all planning projects and design projects that are very dependent on maps or plan view, um, oftentimes planners and designers forget that this is probably a foreign vantage point for folks, that a lot of people that reside in the neighborhoods that we are investing in and some capacity through our work, um, don't spend a ton of time looking at it from that point of view. And so I think um, we kind of spoke already to um, the ways in which we conducted outreach for those that aren't necessarily tech savvy or have regular access to computer. But I think the other real benefit of story maps that we discovered throughout this process was that uh, looking at a plan view map did not help folks at the school convey to us what they really wanted um, to articulate in terms of what was working and what wasn't really working for them in the neighborhood. And so the videos and photos and also just a written analysis that we could kind of mull over together was really integral um, for us as researchers to understand the sort of spatial phenomenons they wanted us to come away with in order to give them recommendations. So I think even somewhat accidentally, we realized that 
you know, this is our common misconception as planners is that people are super familiar with what things look like top down. And it's the reality is it, it's just, it looks foreign to them. And so instead of spending so much time trying to get them adjusted to what's North and South and East and West, we dove into videos and we dove into photographs uh, as a way to really extract more information. One thing I've learned in the Zoom space is it's impossible for more than one person to talk at the same time, you know, so it's gotten me to listen better and pause a little bit to think about the connections I'm trying to make and be more deliberate. I think that's all the time we have for this session. I know that there's another one coming up. But I wanted to thank Emily and Karen, Casey and Rainey for sharing your work today. It's so important to hear these stories and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to listen in. Thank you for having us. And I am so excited to go watch the uh, indigenous and critical cartographies or counter cartographies webinar when that's recorded. Yeah, I'll see you there. Thank you. Bye. Bye.